Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. Again, I request order. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and I would like to welcome all of you. I would, the college consists of the following format. We have first, we have a brief announcements period. Second, we have our speaker who will speak. Then we will have a question and answer period. After that, we will then entertain questions. Tonight's speaker is Bob Lichtenberg, who will be speaking on the meeting. Let's, uh, well, okay, Professor Paul, I'm sorry. Uh, Professor Robert Lichtenberg discusses his new book, which is now available online at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and XLibris.com, its publisher. Okay, we'll, that's enough. All right, <laughs> let's welcome Bob Lichtenberg. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Find it over here, Bob. Forward. Back. Okay. Okay. Very simple. I'll be back in a minute. Thanks a lot, Tim, and thanks everybody for coming. I commend you on your taste. You're interested in making union. You're in the minority. Get it? Yes, not. Can you hear me okay? Now we can. Um, um, I said, I commend you on your taste for coming to hear about making meaning, but you're in the minority. Oh, right. Majority doesn't want to make meaning. They don't care. And a lot of people know about it, too, but they, they got better things to do. Right? Sure. They make meaning. Well, they're making meaning, but it's not much. Anyway, I've been, uh, it's great to be here at the college. Great place. Discussing social issues every week since 1951, almost every week. <laughs> In recent years, much thanks to Charlie's work, single-handed work, an effort for many years now. Appreciate that. And, uh, but um, I really appreciate Doug Binkley's help on my book. He helped me a tremendous amount. I never would have gotten any of it done without his help. He would come many days in the middle of the winter. He would walk three miles to a train. Uh, and then take the bus to my house because he didn't have a car and help me set this thing up. I, I couldn't have done any of it. And it's very difficult. You've got to be a publisher. I got a new edition of my book, and um, Doug just, the real estate, just read, oh, you know, most of you know him, of course. But um, <laughs> it was recently his birthday, so let's give him a big hand for all that. Look up to me. Thank you. Okay, um, does everyone have a handout uh, of my talk? I'm going to follow up briefly. And I'm going to pass around copies of my book to look at if you like, page through it. If you like. Oh, wait, let me give you the new edition. Where the heck is it? I only got the small one, which I need. Oh, well, you have to do it with the old one because I'm not going to go looking for it now while you're waiting. Uh, here somewhere. Um, make sure you especially look at the picture of my uh, beautiful wife on page two. Um, <clears throat> but she's now deceased. Uh, yeah, this is a shorter version of my book. That's why I'm talking. I talked once before in the longer version when it came out in the fall, uh, uh, December, November 2017. About five people came because there was a snowstorm, the only one of the winter. Uh, one of them was drunk, too, by the way. I went to his house to pick him up. He didn't have his pants on. He was in his underwear. I should have left him there. But, uh, he was maximizing meaning. Meaning uh, Christmas. Yeah, his escaping meaning. I'm going to talk about the way escaping. We do that a lot. <clears throat> Uh, before I start, I want to show off and pass around uh, an article that I had published on a journal I wrote called The Meaning of Life, which is very different from Making Meaning. Well, it's pretty different. It's very close, too, in some ways. But it's very different in other ways. And someone later did a tribute about my journal, and they sent out a great reporter, John Anderson, and he did a great job. That's the article. 
And if you want one, you can have it. Um, you take it. You're busy. <laughs> Uh, this, if you want one, take one. I'm just showing off with that one. All right, let's talk about making meaning. Uh, what is meaning? It's a very, very ambiguous word. I myself, in my journal, The Meaning of Life, which I published, and had a big hit with one. Let's check this off. Tim, he dropped that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I did drop it. Where did it go? Let me see. I don't see it. I don't know how to use this thing anyway, but it should be simple. There. Forward. Back. Leave it here. Oh yeah, that's good. Okay. All right, meaning is a very ambiguous word. In my journal, I use the word meaning in 80 different senses, and I documented all of them: the purpose, uh, significance, significant. Uh, uh, but the main definition of meaning is something's impact, the effect of something. That's what something means. It's relationship to or anything, that's what meaning is, uh, impact. But the way I use the word meaning, it usually means a positive, it refers to a positive impact, having a good impact, having a good effect, you know, with your life, with your actions. And um, that's what I mean by that word. Um, it's a new word. Um, it usually refers to words. I'm not certain I'm going to talk about words at all. Very little after. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's all I'm going to talk about words for tonight. But uh, it's a new word, which means the greatest philosophers and thinkers, theologians, they, they didn't have that word and they didn't use that word. Plato didn't have it. Aristotle didn't have it. Kant didn't have it. Hegel. None of the current thinkers, well, current thinkers had it. Victor Frankl made so 10 million copies in the U.S. of Man's Search for Meaning. And you know that book very rarely treated meaning. You know, they had a handful of sayings about meaning. Uh, you know, even if you're in a concentration camp, if you have meaning or purpose, you'll survive. That's what Frankl said. Uh, he so 10 million copies, maybe because of the word, Man's Search for Meaning. <clears throat> but anyway, it's a new word. Uh, not for me though, but, uh, and you know, it was never fully developed, the idea of meaning or making meaning to my book, of course, <laughs> I'm bragging again. I developed it fully, meaning, the concept and making meaning in my book, which came out in, uh, like I say, November of 2017. Uh, it's over 200 pages, but that's too long, I realized. I was trained to do a comprehensive job, but I realized uh, people too busy screwing on their, their phones <laughs> to read much these days. So um, I will, uh, you know, I, I decided I need to make a shorter version, an abridged version, which I did, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, this little version. That Doug Bingley was totally instrumental in helping me get out because I could never have gotten this out myself. It's only 56 pages and talks about what is meaning and how to make it and a couple other things. Uh, a big print, wide columns, short, colored photos, colored images. <laughs> <You know. coughs> Excuse me, I tried to make it as easy and clear and simple as I could. Such a grand topic. Uh, but okay, making meaning, or maximizing meaning is the name of my new book. Isn't, isn't that why we are here? Isn't that the reason? Isn't that the main reason? Is to make meaning. Why else are we here? Is to make as much meaning as we can. Why not? Why, what could be more? What else? What, you know, what other purpose could life, our lives have? Uh, uh, isn't that the, our goal? Any, any comments or questions? Anyone disagree? 
Let's wait till question time, Bob. Let's wait till question time. Oh, well, I'd like to take a look at your comments, but, uh, yeah, let's try and keep them brief. Um, you know, a little interaction with her. You got rules. Wouldn't be against the rules, I don't think. Um, all right, I think if, uh, I think uh, we're here to make meaning to maximize our meaning. That's why we're here. Uh, um, and uh, um, if you do make meaning, maximize meaning, you live the fullest life you can. It will be in all uh, in all areas. You have to. No, I'm I'm getting Heather. Oh, uh, you, you have the richest, most rewarding life that you could live. It will be the deepest life <coughs> Excuse me. that you can live. You'll be noble. You'll be struggling to make <laughs> meaning. And most people and the universe and the earth doesn't care about your making meaning. You know, hardly anyone cares about it. So you're making meaning. Um, you're being noble. Um, the noblest life we could live. Where did I point this? <laughs> I used to use these in class by him. Uh, I'll show you. Albert Camus. I got it. I got it. Thank you. Albert Camus, a uh, philosopher, great novelist right of there. the absurd. Okay. Uh, he said, yeah, you know, life's absurd, but at least when you try to make meaning, um, uh, you're asserting your freedom and you're scorning your fate of nothingness. You're scorning it. You're saying, I'm just going to make meaning anyway. You know? I'll mention him again. Well, you know what? I'm, why don't I mention him now? He, um, he says, uh, Camus says, uh, if you like, he wrote in the myth of Sisyphus about this mythical guy rolling a rock up a hill all his life, and the rock just keeps tumbling down and gets too heavy, you know, and that's, that's our lives. We're going to all do that, you know, but um, Camus says in the myth of Sisyphus that uh, 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 there's one really philosophical question, and he uses the word meaning, whether or not life has enough meaning, and uh, if it doesn't have enough meaning, you'll end it all. For you, you know, enough meaning for you. Uh, he's, he's right, he's right. People find their lives meaningless, take it. You know, if it lacks too much meaning for them, they end it all. That's how important, that's how fundamental this idea of meaning is. Uh, also, if you uh, pursue meaning, you, you'll have a lot of joy in your life by making meaning, and that's a lot more than the fun that most people are after. They just want to have fun, you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, but they're like kids, you know. <laughs> kids want to have fun, but, but adults should want to have joy. The joy of making me of understanding ideas and doing something with them. So it could help you live a joyful life and the best life overall that you can, if you make meaning. So we ought to, all of us ought to constantly ask throughout our lives, the meaning question is, how can I maximize my meaning? With every action I do, I aim for that. <laughs> uh, might not reach it. The meaning manifesto says we all have the right to make meaning with our lives. And we all have the duty to do so. That's the meaning manifesto that I made up. Uh, making meaning is the greatest value you can have. All, all values have meaning. Everything has meaning. Uh, everything has some meaning. Try to maximize the good meaning. Um, uh, okay, if you don't have enough meaning, you'll end your life, like Camus says. And if you um, uh, lack meaning, uh, you, you won't be happy if your life lacks meaning too much. And you might even lash out in violence at people because you're angry for your lack of meaning. Say you're born under poverty. Or you have parents who didn't care, like mine. <laughs> uh, oh, I got, uh, um, everyone, even tippers, 
typical person. The seekers here, there's a lot of seekers here. Appreciate it. Um, no, I talk about the typical person a lot, and, and I call them tipper. But even tippers, are, they all cry out for meaning in their lives. Uh, various degrees, usually it's not a crisis, you know, but we all want meanings. We just don't use the word. Um, one way to make meaning a quick way is just to connect with something bigger than yourself, something bigger. And you have more meaning, you have more impact, more effect, more relationship. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, okay, uh, the, the main way of making meaning is through what I call the sources of meaning or the avenues of making meaning, um, ways of making meaning, big areas of our life in which we can make um, much meaning, a lot of meaning. Um, first one is quality relationships uh, between two people. Love is the highest, that's hard to define, but I'll define it as unconditional giving, giving to others without expecting another, without expecting back or others. Um, that's probably the best relationship, the highest relationship, as big as that is. But uh, Martin Buber, who's pictured here, uh, wrote a lot about being a Lao and saying Lao. Uh, that's then you're almost sacred or holy. The Tao talks about what's unique and special about the situation and talks about meaning and the meaning of life. It's not where you would expect it. And like in a marriage, you don't find it there very often. But uh, he often talks about strangers saying Tao to each other. It's a brief coming and going, he says. Problem of relationships, a big problem of relationships, especially in my life, <laughs> is that the other person can always refuse your, um, your offer of a good relationship, or your offer of love, they can refuse that. Um, and they often do, because they're too busy. Or they have other things on their mind. And there's not, not much you can do about that. What could you do about that? You know, reason with the person, and they ought to love me. They ought to be my friend, accept my friendship, and then I don't have some problems. It's, 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 um, it's often pretty hard for two people just to get along uh, on a regular, intimate basis, or any casual. <laughs> well, casual is no risk, but that. Rodney King said that. Rodney King, not Martin Luther King, but Rodney King was the guy who the uh, L.A. Cops Club many, many times. He was a known drug addict, but still he was down and out. They kept calling, calling. And then there was a riot in Los Angeles following his beating. And he looks and sees the devastation brought about it by it. And he says, can't we get along? Good question. I'll be you know, can answer that pretty well. All right, the second way of making community is, um, <coughs> Oh, sorry, the second source of meaning is, nope, oh, wow, wait a minute, here's a preview. <laughs> Some of these are out of order from what I presented before. Oh, I don't even know if I have this one. Oh, well, no, I don't. All that for nothing. Uh, I gotta go back, I'm sorry. Um, Second way is to make community. A community is a group of people who know each other on a first name basis and they have a common goal or purpose like to improve their neighborhood, to improve their uh, neighborhood schools, or just to have some goal in common that they work toward. Uh, good thing Tim's not here to yell at me again. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have put it there, I should put it where he said. Sorry again. Um, yeah, um, group of people getting along, working together, uh, the college of the community, good one. Um, 
By the way, I've been coming here since 1980 myself. Like I got back to Chicago in 1980 off and on, but I missed the ones on uh, politics because I don't think those are going to make any. <laughs> uh, but I made a lot of the others. Uh, um, only I think the only one older, longer in attendance, I'd be Charlie, I think, and my link of attendance because I was going before he was, but uh, the only one who may be me was Sid Cohen. And go and wander. And he was supposed to be here tonight. I don't think he got his right. Because my neighbor, neighbor Michael, I don't know where I am. No, I'm sorry. He's not here. Uh, but, uh, okay, yeah, the college is a community. This college, uh, the re a real college where people come to learn, not to get jobs. <laughs> um, uh, the sense of community has really declined, like in the book Bowling Alone, by what's the guy's name? I just forgot. Robert Putnam. 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 Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Putnam had marched the decline of community in recent couple decades, I think he says. It's about 50 percent, he estimates. And he, he does a good job. Okay, it's hard to measure stuff like that, but he, he does a good job. It's declined 50 percent in recent decades, the sense of community. But uh, everyone should be a member of one community. I don't think a lot of people are myself. I don't know. I'm just guessing myself. <laughs> it doesn't require one much time. I mean, the, the, the community might be, they, they might have a meeting once a week, a month, and uh, you'd have to do a little work for that. Um, even there, you'd be doing good, you know, better than most people. <laughs> uh, there's a lot. And then, when, when you make meaning for others, you double your meaning. You get meaning out of it, and they get meaning out of it. They get a little. You know, you help them, and uh, that adds to your meaning. Um, you can even make meaning, make a community with nature like I do every morning. One of the first things I do is I feed the birds in my yard. And they're very appreciative, much more than humans are. <laughs> They're glad to get their bird seed, you know. So are the squirrels and rats, but uh, that's all right. Rats are, they're very intelligent animals. It's hard to beat them. You know, that's okay. You don't bother me. Uh, uh, when I uh, walk my dog in the dog park every day, I'm getting exercise, walking fast, um, and recreation in nature, and doing good for my dog. It's a non-human community again, and I'm meeting friends and I pick up litter. <laughs> now if I see it, I carry a bag and I put in garbage. You have people strewn around making their neighborhood look disrespectful. Uh, it's quadrupling meaning, not much, but a little. Um, okay, and, and we should try and be as visible as possible. I do. Like when I walk along reading a book, I try to read it. I try to make the book as visible as I can, <laughs> so that people see it and realize that they should be reading books too, I and mean, they probably haven't read as much as they can. It might remind them. You know, when I'm in the dog park reading my book, um, at Porridge Park usually, um, uh, I see a lot of people pull out their computers and play on those, but almost, almost everyone does. <laughs> their phones, I mean their phones. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, because humans are very imitative animals. We imitate what other people do. If you see someone reading, you say, well, maybe I should read too, you know, uh, because the other person is permitting that and monitoring, uh, yeah, making a, a model of it, modeling it. Humans are very imitative. Third source of meaning is dialogue. Uh, Martin Buber was big on this. It's his word for close, intimate discussion. Wow, but that's a little much for me. I'd be happy if I could get a serious discussion about ideas or feelings. That would be great. That would be very meaningful. People talk about trivia all the time. Yeah, there are rules. I have them in my book. I won't, there's too many of them. Guidelines for dialogue. I won't mention them now. There's about five or six main ones. Um, Okay, so fourth sort of meaning is fulfilling work, finding fulfilling work. This eludes a lot of people. A lot of people end up working just to make a paycheck, and that's very... That puts a deadness at the heart of their life. 
they'd have to figure that out. Uh, uh, well, I do. I do to support themselves and their families. You know, they get stuck in jobs and they don't want to do them. And that's how we spend most of our waking time and energy. Does that work? You know? So um, hopefully it will be meaningful. If you do a good job, that has meaning. If you do a service to others, that has meaning to some. <laughs> but it's always best, of course, to have a fulfilling job. Let me know if you can't hear me, please. I'll make out anything I think. Just raise your hand and I'll recognize you. Um, uh, Spence Turkle says that people want a calling, not so much a job, they want some calling in life. You know? <coughs> and the main thing that workers want, Studs found out in his book, Working, we interviewed a lot of workers in different fields, a great book, Working. It was a good play too, a lot bombed on Broadway, but what did they know there? They, they know, you know how to dance and sing, so it's pretty much funny. Well, it was a great play and a great book, Working, and Studs says most people just want to leave somewhere reminder that they were here, like a construction worker makes, makes a building, and uh, a, a business investor creates businesses, and a, and a housewife who starts praise. Uh, 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 raises a child, which is the hardest job there is. It was for me, and I didn't succeed either. But because uh, my society interfered, you know, they said they overwhelmed them, all kinds of other chum. You know, uh, and other reasons I won't go into now, of course. But uh, yeah, being a housewife is hard work, but fulfilling. Uh, source number five is um, material possessions stuff, things, that's why most people work, is so that they can buy things, you know, and that makes them happy and that gives them meaning, but not for long, recent studies show most things make people happy for no more than an hour, they're glad they buy something, you know, a new piece of clothing, a new piece of furniture, they're real glad when they get it, but shortly thereafter they're thinking, what else can I buy? I wish I could buy something else, you know, for almost all their possessions. Are, they're not satisfying. They're necessary, of course. <clears throat> but they're certainly not enough. Uh, they don't have a lot of meaning. If we get on a hedonic treadmill, we get a little pleasure and we want more pleasure. It's like we're like those uh, hamsters in the cave that are running around the circle. And we, you know, just keep running in a circle, buying stuff. You know, and, and this is a very shallow way of life, but it seduces a lot of people. Because um, it's physical, concrete, you don't need any imagination to appreciate it whatsoever. You can see the stuff you buy. But well, we really need alternatives, higher alternatives, like a sense of community, like seeking God, like the finding fulfilling work, or like making a quality relationship if the other person will let you. Um, uh, um, the money is a good means, but um, because it keeps us from fighting over things, now we fight over money. But money is never the, never should be mistaken as a main goal or in their life. It's just too shallow for them. It's needed, but not enough for much meaning. All right, way number six is a big one. Seeking God. Trying to find God. Oh, okay. You finally changed, but just ready for another farce. Oh, there he is. There's God. <laughs> Uh, I hope you could read that, probably not. Um, that's <coughs> important. That's important. Oops. Um, God could be the greatest source of meaning easily because if the stories about God are true, you don't really die. You go to heaven. 
and live happily forever with all your uh, loved ones and your enemies are in hell burning. Oh, that's terrifying to go to hell and burn there forever. Like I was taught by the nuns, you know, they taught me that, you know. And with us in the line made many of us resentful later, of course, like me, but, um, oh, oh, oh. Uh, before I forget. Okay, so God can be a gigantic source of meaning. Uh, this isn't in my handout, but, oops, and it's coming out real well, but, I think all the world religions, all the main religions of the world, you see, symbolize, you see the symbols there. All of them capture some truth about God, but no one has, none of them have the whole truth. Some I believe in all the world religions. The truths I find most meaningful. Uh, that's in my book, it's in my journal too. One of the last issues of my journal. I haven't written that lately. <laughs> I've been too busy with the book. Um, Okay, but the God question is, does God truly exist? Is there really a God or not? That is a very difficult and hard question. It's a, it's a big question. Certainly, the biggest question, the hardest question. These are just all the world religions. Uh, Baha'i, uh, I don't know, it's some of my Christianity, of course, Orthodox, uh, Islam, Jain, Jainism, Judaism. Uh, uh, um, uh, paganism. Okay. All right, that's enough of those. Um, all right, back to God. Where did where did where did God go? Now I'm thinking. Nope. All right. Uh, the God question asks: Is there really a God? Does God really exist? Is there an old man with a great beard and above the clouds? taking care of us? Well, that's a really hard question. But it's one well worth our attention, one I think we should devote ourselves to every day because there's no bigger and better question. No more meaningful question than will we live forever in happiness or will we die and there won't be anything? There won't even be the blackness. There won't be nothing. You won't be aware of nothing. You'll be nothing. You know, if there's no God. That frightens a lot of people, that prospect, because yeah, we have no experience in that one, except sleeping. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of stories about God, but I don't think you can go by the stories or the history. It's not reliable. Uh, because, you know, it was edited by people who want to believe it, and because uh, <clears throat> it's optimistic and flattering that there is a God who gives us happiness in heaven forever with our loved ones. But um, but you don't need stories. Uh, those probably aren't true. Uh, some are pretty good. Judaism, Christianity, especially Judaism. <laughs> They're terrific stories. But um, uh, what you really need is a reason for believing that God truly exists. And philosophers call this an argument. They don't mean you disagree. They just mean you try and argue for God. There's three main arguments for God. One, there's the uh, creator argument for God's existence. Let's see if I can find that. Well, St. Thomas Aquinas there argues for the creator argument. You know, he did that in the 13th century, and he was the first one to do that. Thomas Aquinas. <clears throat> Aquinas, a great philosopher and theologian. Um, oh, okay. Uh, uh, um, all right, the creator argument just uh, argues that the universe had to have a creator. There has to be something greater than the universe. There has to be something higher than the universe. There has to be a power more than the uh, universe because, uh, because everything has a cause or a reason, better word than cause. Cause refers to physical existence. Everything has a cause. Every physical thing has a cause. Even your actions, almost all of them, except the free ones, which I think are rare, but I can't go into that tonight. We'll be here all night. I'm taking too long already, but um, <clears throat> there has to be a reason for the universe, a greater power or force to make it exist. And this has recently been supported by the Big Bang Theory. 
probably the big bang dolphin. I guess. It's the next one. There is a big bang, but there were Shutterstock is the name of the agency that follows those uh, images. Um, well, it wasn't really a bang anyhow. <laughs> well, there was a bang later, but uh, Nobel Prize winning scientists like Higgs of the Higgs boson have recently proven that 13.7 billion years ago, there was nothing, nothing exists. There was no time, of course. I'll bring ice cream. There's no space and no matter. No matter, no time, no space existed 13.7 billion years ago. And they could pinpoint that. And that gives strong support, almost scientific, not quite, to the uh, <coughs> creator argument. Second argument, good one, strong one today, for God's existence is um, the design argument that just says the universe, especially the earth, has a grand design or a plan to it. Uh, this couldn't have happened by chance. It worked so well so many times and it's just marvelous. Just go out on a bright sunny day and everything seems to work so well together that this couldn't have just happened by chance. This, this seems to be Evolution can explain how it occurred very well. Very well. But evolution cannot explain why it occurred. And maybe there is no why, though. Maybe there is no why. Am I might take that seriously. Uh, third is mystical experiences of God. Uh, our personal experiences. Millions of people, even today, claim that they have experienced God. Most of these people live in the Orient. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of cool. Christian fundamentalists uh, and evangelicals who claim they have experienced God in their daily lives. Most of them are full of it, of course. Most of them are desperate and deluded. <laughs> like uh, St. Francis. Well, I mean, Francis, I forget her name, I'm not sure. You know, a famous Christian mystic. Anyway, whatever her name is. Yeah, Teresa. 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 Not Teresa. Not Teresa. Yeah, that one there. St. Teresa, thank you, Bob. Uh, St. Teresa was a mystic. She probably had something wrong with her physically. <laughs> uh, she says she experienced God many times. There are an angel piercing her heart with an arrow. I noticed the expression on her face. She was a nun, by the way, Teresa. The expression on her face. Can anyone describe it, Tim? Uh, Will you allow me? I'll get it. Uh, what kind of expression does she have on her face? Beific. Pardon me, Laura? Beific. Uh, beatific? Uh, kind of, yeah, sure. It's like she's experiencing God. She's overwhelmed by God, certainly. Uh, to me, she looks like she's having an orgasm. She's a nun who is deprived of sexuality, but she has to get it in other ways, and she does it by imagining. Uh, <laughs> Union with God. I'll leave that to your imagination, but uh, <laughs> uh, but all you need is one good case, not her. She's not a good case. Uh, of uh, someone who really did experience God, and many claim they can, and especially in Eastern uh, philosophy and religions for many centuries. But it, it takes a lot of discipline, but they do it. They train themselves through yoga, mental and physical. Eventually, though, they claim they feel united with God um, after they go through a lot of physical stuff that we do in the West. <laughs> yeah, for our health, you know, shows our interest yeah, in ourselves. Not God. Okay, those are the main arguments for God today creator, designer, mystical, or personal experiences of God. A lot of people today, of course, you know, are total materialists. Um, I, many people are agnostic or atheists, mostly agnostic, I think. They say, we can't know if that exists, because all we can know is physical stuff, man. That's all we can know is physical things, you know, what we get to see and touch and experience. That's all we can know, man. That's it. That's all I was taught, if I was even taught that, <laughs> about knowledge. But, but, you know, if you claim you can't know God, you better have a good theory of knowledge about 
intangibles like that. Now I'm no agnostic to even think about knowledge. They just dismiss the question, say, oh, it's too big, we can't know immaterial things like that. I'm sorry I'm mocking them, I shouldn't mock them. Um, uh, you know, they just have a lot of questions, or they question all their life, and they say, well, if I live a good life, God will reward me at the end. No, they're going to be very disappointed. They'll be very disappointed if there is a God. <laughs> and if there is a hell, it's an unthreatened my generation, uh, they'll be burning there forever. Uh, <laughs> um, because they didn't take the God question seriously. Well, maybe they couldn't help it, because our society sure doesn't, you know. You know, we just want stuff. We want things, you know. We don't care much about God. But, uh, okay, so, um, uh, we all should go on a lifelong pilgrimage to find out whether or not there is a God. And that's the best we can do, and it might go either way, but we should do it daily. What else has more meaning, or could have more meaning? Uh, seventh source is intangibles, which I talk about a lot at the um, Seekers Dialogues. Uh, intangibles are not physical ideas like God, knowledge, language, the idea of a language, mathematics, and physical, although you might be derived from physical, I can't do that, of course. And intangibles are deep values such as goodness, beauty, and truth. These could have much meaning, but they're extremely hard to know. How do you know them? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for thinking they exist, I list them there. Uh, and I can give you a lot of examples if you're interested, but I won't do it now. <coughs> They're in my book. About like five or six examples. And uh, of specific ones, and there's many throughout my book, of intangible truths. Uh, we live mostly for intangibles, God, if you're religious, which most people aren't today, they want physical stuff only. That's all they can comprehend. It's what they can see or touch. Uh, we live for love. We live for respect. We live for caring. These are all intangible. Uh, peace. And, um, goodwill. Not to have the horrors of war. Um, and I wish I could go into that, but I don't have time. Um, it's, it's just horrible. And it's glorified on the lakefront. There's a million idiots looking at it today. Well, they don't realize probably being indoctrinated. And most of them think they're just having fun. That's what they want. It's enough for them. That said, wish they wanted more. Wish that somehow they would want more. I don't know how to do that. Um, all right, uh, we live for intangibles. They're very hard to know, extremely hard to know. They're, um, all I could say is we um, just need to think hard about them. That's the best we could do. Think, reason, abstractly. Uh, and use the laws of logic to guide us. Logic gives us rules for good thinking. There are rules for good thinking. It's not always clear when they apply, but it pretty often is. And they can test thinking. I got an appendix up. It's the only appendix in my book is on the rules of logic, some rules of logic, laws of logic. And they can really test thinking and determine which is good and which is bad. And that will get us out of the horrible relativism, horrible relativism that we have today that uh, it's your opinion, you know, you want to believe your opinion, that's okay, just don't hurt me, and stuff like that. Yeah, very shallow again, superficial philosophy, relativism. Logic is a way of overcoming that. It's because it's a ways of testing, it's not easy, but there is a test. Now, we could know intangible truths, but um, 
how do we test one? Uh, um, um, again, like Aristotle said, you use intuition, and intuition is um, uh, um, uh, uh, just immediate grasp for the truth after much reflection about it. And the test, for the test, is that it makes our lives more meaningful, our lives, not just my life, in the long run. Uh, so, uh, in the uh, intangibles, do we have power to emanate of power? And let's try and be in touch with that power. Source of meaning number uh, eight in the last source is uh, the arts. This has been a great source of meaning for me. The arts have much creativity, much imagination. Oh, oh, the universe, see how big it is? See how big that thing is? Those are galaxies, uh, uh, probably more than that. Hubble disclosed these to us in the 1990s. There are millions of galaxies, millions. We can't even imagine how many there are. Each one of those little circles of light is uh, millions of galaxies, millions of them. It's just so huge, it's hard to comprehend. I forgot to mention it. Um, let's get back to our... Um, all right, this great philosopher, Immanuel Kant, I'm going to a meetup on his uh, third critique. The first one is pure reason, which is really pure reading. <laughs> you can read it a thousand times, you know, understand because it was so profound and, uh, oh well. Uh, but he wrote on beauty, too, his third critique. second one was on ethics, morals. They're excellent, but they're very really difficult. Kind. Um, let's see, but I don't pick them up right away. Um, okay, art has a lot of imagination, a lot of creativity. Those are the highest uh, mental faculties we have. Imagination. Seeing different images. Taking an image and doing something. Wow. Creativity, you're making a new... Oh, I'll get to creativity. Um, okay, but we could get meaning from art in a lot of ways, if you have a lot of imagination. You can interpret a work of art, you can explain the meaning of a work of art <clears throat> to yourself. Just get, give, an, give an interpret, oops, wrong way, sorry. Uh, I interpret this work of art at the Art Institute um, to express two people's love, general love, of each other, as you can tell, he's kissing her, she's smiling. They, they love the dance, they love the music, they love the country. Yeah, that's how I interpret it, I didn't explain it. I use a little imagination, I have a little bit of knowledge about it. You need a little knowledge, relevant knowledge, and you need a little imagination. We, we all have some, but we're not encouraged to use it. Well, it wasn't when I was in school. <laughs> <laughs> Might be different now. Uh, another way of uh, getting meaning out of art is, um, as Kant said in his third critique, just to be fascinated by perceiving something like the colors, the shape, the sound. Just, just like it. Just enjoy perceiving it for its own sake, not for any practical purpose. You just like looking at the colors or the design. You just like it. That's what Kant said, he had great insight. 1790, he took us to get far. I think it was later than that. Little, in Kant wrote his third critique. Um, okay, and third is creativity, or making new ideas, and art does that. Oh, oh this, um, Hindu image of the god Shiva, she's dancing in a ring of fire, creating the universe. She also destroys the universe with her dance when she stops dancing. That takes a lot of imagination to present something like that. I always love this. This always fascinated me at the Art Institute. I was always fascinated by it. I don't know why. She's got a lot of arms, <laughs> so she could do a lot. She has to create and destroy the universe. A lot of imagination. Uh, the Picasso downtown. Uh, Chicago Picasso, what is it? 
Is it uh, a dog? An Afghan dog? Is it a woman? One of Picasso's many lovers? Uh, could be interpreted as many things. Uh, uh, mostly, it's a mystery. But it's, it just kind of grabs me. But it's a mystery like Chicago is. Many things, many peoples, many cultures, many customs, clearly food symbolizes all that. I might have the uh, that's how I interpret the Chicago Picasso. Um, Doug Binkley had a great interpretation. It's in my book. <laughs> of, uh, that's why I'm holding it. Beethoven is Ninth Symphony. Beethoven looked for God, and you know what? He couldn't find him. If God didn't answer. <laughs> but Beethoven finds joy in any line. He finds profound joy, and you can hear it. You can hear the joy. There's no greater joy expressed in music, if you ask me. But I can't go into that in more detail right now. But those are some examples of creativity in the arts. Um, it makes a lot of new feelings. Uh, vivid, concrete ideas you can find in art. I can't go into that right now. But in my book, some examples. New great ideas about life and how to live life. Uh, and can make new art forms, like Calder, uh, is that how you pronounce Calder? Uh, made an abstract sculpture, but the sculpture was not stationary. It was on a wire, and it would re revolve in the wind. And they said, oh, I like your sculpture, Calder. And he says, that's not a sculpture, that's a mobile. It moves, it moves, it moves with the wind. It made a new art, kind of. <laughs> It's a type of sculpture, to be sure, but still new. And then Picasso made collages that would stand out three-dimensional from the surface yeah. of the painting. Invented yeah. a new art, partially anyhow. Uh, he wasn't the only guy. Matter of fact, he wasn't the main guy. But it, you know, you've heard of him. <laughs> you haven't heard of the other guy who really invented collages, created a new art form. Uh, but art is mostly about emotions. It's about feelings. Yeah. Profound feelings, deep feelings, yeah, all kinds of feelings from happiness, extreme like in Beethoven's joy in the Ninth Symphony, even though God didn't answer his call, he was knocking on heaven's door, he got no answer, but he still found joy in the brotherhood of humans, who well, he called the brotherhood of man. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, you can find all kinds of feelings. They're very specific feelings, says Aaron Copeland. But you'd have a very hard time naming them. They range from happiness to joy and sorrow. I said, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but um, it's not so important to name the feelings. It's just to feel them, to experience them, to be aware of them, to be aware of the happiness and the joy. Um, Okay, and uh, you can even experience beauty. Big idea to Plato. The greatest ideas of Plato. Kant said that too in his third critique. And he used it to unify knowledge, truth, and uh, morals, ethics in his first two critiques. But, um, Um, yeah, we can experience beauty. There's no greater value. It contains the good. It can express the good. Like, for example, David, the sculpture. I don't have a slide. I should have made for him. But he, somehow Michelangelo like, made some marble look like flesh. How the hell do you do that? But he did it. He could do it. He had great skill, but he had great ideas, too. Michelangelo said, David, had supreme confidence in God that God would allow him, even though he was naked, <laughs> my David was naked, but he was going to um, slay the giant Goliath with his little old slingshot. He did. He had confidence in God. And that's an example of beauty. I think, well, Plato would, because he would say it has the proper proportions and great ideas. And that's what beauty was 
for Plato, a harmony of, uh, of proportions. It's a, it's a mysterious harmony. It's none you could predict or write down in a specific way. All right, those are the main sources of meaning. Now, if meaning was really as important as I'm saying, you know, we would have went for it a long time ago, but we didn't. We still don't. <laughs> Uh, the reason for that is uh, what I call escapes. Everyone's trying to escape from meaning all the time. Not every, well, not all the time, but <laughs> most, <laughs> most of it. A lot of people are trying to escape from meaning. They're, they realize it's hard to find meaning. It's hard to make meaning. It's um, uh, but a very grim prospect that your life might not have meaning. Then you end it all. So what do they do? They escape. They run away from meaning. They try and have fun. They try not to think about it. They try to keep busy. They try to keep kill time. That's what I mean by escape. Killing time. Distracting yourself from making meaning. Because it's so hard. Uh, <clears throat> well, not, but sometimes. But they don't have no clue, and they don't want a clue because it's too much for most people. So they just give up and escape. Like, uh, but uh, all I can say to, to escape from escaping, you got to know about making meaning. Think about it. That's what you got to do. Think about it. <laughs> so you can do it. The only book on it is mine. <laughs> Uh, try to escape from making, trying to escape the escapes of making meaning like many people try and do, much of their time. <laughs> oh, they don't realize it, of course. And realize what big rewards are for making meaning, how much joy you can get from your life if you're aware of making meaning. No one has enough meaning. There's one regular here who says he has enough meaning in his life. He's not here today, but you know, you can't have enough meaning. You can always make more. Thank you. And, um, uh, you can always make more, and it always makes your life better. In all ways, and more fulfilling, all the ways I described at the start. Uh, but we are hindered by time. Time terrorizes everyone. That's the word I would use to describe time. It's a terrorist. It terrorizes us. There's never enough time to make all the meaning that I want. Uh, and that's a problem for all of us, especially me. <laughs> I have an image of this. Oops. Well, it's nothing profound. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a typical person being worn out by work um, and the things you got to do just to survive. <coughs> How could you ever get around to flourishing, which we should do, like flowers do, like I just asked about last week, didn't get an answer, but, um, uh, you know, we're here to prosper. We're not here to survive. We're here to do the best that we can do. And then we have a laugh. Yeah, it um, But time is a great obstacle to us. Yeah, meaning subjective. Yeah, what something means is subjective, personal, sure, yeah, sure. But that's not important. What something means to someone. You know, it is objective. It's really out there. And we really can make it. We really can know it. It's not easy. But we can discover it. We can find it in things, actions, and even ideas like intangible, but oh, that's extremely hard. And you can find it in what we do, in helping others. Most meaning should be for others, not for yourself, I would say. Uh, finally, uh, there's uh, ending here with uh, a little bit on the meaning of life. Another little topic that's pretty different. The meaning of life is uh, your purpose in life. What's your purpose? What's the point of your life? Big question, perhaps the biggest. Um, uh, uh, I think the meaning, for me, the meaning of life, this has only been addressed recently, directly, indirectly, it's in every philosopher. That's a big difference. If you don't say it on, in words, 
you're kind of not emphasizing it whatsoever. But for me, the meaning of life consists of four of the sources. One is good quality relationships, which you don't have a whole lot of control over because the other can always reject you. <laughs> and they often do, at least me. <laughs> Uh, two, finding fulfilling work, which a lot of people have a real hard time with. Um, this world's not that kind of world. Um, having enough possessions, yeah, you've got to survive. But again, they're not satisfying for long. And finally, being guided by ideas, intangible ideas about what is good, what is beautiful, what is true, what is just in your relationships to others. Um, all right, so to conclude, we all should try and make, you know, know about meaning as much as we can and make as much as we can. Why not leave a legacy of meaning? Our Oprah Winfrey calls it with a straight face, a legacy, L-E-A-G-H apostrophe, no, L-E-G-H comma S-H-E, legacy. It actually means it for women. But yeah, we should leave a legacy of meaning especially of our ideas and what we did with our lives. So that's the end of my talk, and I'm going the wrong way as usual on this thing. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. What's that first one? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Go back to two more. Go back to the, the reality symbols of religion. Thank you, thank you. All the symbols. I want to talk about this one. Uh, which one are you acting? All the religious. That one with the top, the top left. What is that? Which one? I'm the sorry. Religions. The religions. Oh, that religion. Oh, gee, yeah, you know, you know, you know, you know, what is that? What is that? This one? I don't know. Anyone know what the religion is? I don't think it's a big one. Where did you get that, uh, that whole thing? Yeah. For different religions? Yeah, they're for different religions. And there are certain many more. Those are some of the main world religions. Uh, yeah, but, um, oh, yeah, do I, oh, anyone know who that is? It's her style. Picture of her style. Uh, he talked about the implied meaning of life. He never stated explicitly what it was. And this is, uh, I do want to mention this, I skipped this. This is Plato's uh, story of the cave. And he says, we're all like people who live in a cave. We live in a cave and we are chained from birth by our senses and we look at the back of the cave, and we see reflections thrown by that fire. You see the fire there? And someone goes by the roadway and carries objects, and we see these reflections on the wall of the cave, and we think that's reality, because that's all we know is what we sense or what we experience. But Plato says, a few individuals struggle out of the cave. They break their chains of the senses and they free themselves, and they go outside and they see the sun, the moon, the stars that symbolize the grand ideas, the great ideas of life. They go back in the cave and try and tell people, and they laugh, and say, oh, you know, all there is is this, this cave here, that's all that exists, you know. They don't get it, they can't comprehend it, that's... Anyhow, it's a great story, Plato told us, the cave. Any, any questions? Who's got a question? All right, let's thank her. Right yeah. Yeah. Uh, you touched on it, an appreciation of how vast the universe is. Can't that negate somebody trying to find some meaning? We're, we're such insignificant pieces of dust compared to the vastness of the universe. And suppose this universe is just the latest in a infinite series of universes that start with a big bang or whatever and expand and then collapse or go out of existence and then it starts all over again. Suppose this has been going on forever. Yeah, all right. Well, we would still have a, what little meaning we have here today. Uh, yeah, I mean, in our lives today, we would still have a little meaning. It wouldn't be much. No, there'd be something. It's worth struggling for. It's not nothing. We shouldn't give up. We can have a lot of meaning for ourselves, at least, and for others. Everyone can. And everyone does have meaning to some extent. Try to maximize it. What I'm saying is, yeah, 
you know, we're not God, you know, but we're, we're human, we're conscious, to make meaning. I think to understand it better, why don't we put things in a numerical value, you know, like, uh, okay, social, life, marriage, work, you know, give it a, 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 a numerical value. And we, we have to understand something, when you're, you're young, certain things are more important to you than when you're older. Like playing baseball when you're 14 years old, very important. That's true. When you're 55, you don't give a darn about it anymore, you know what I'm saying? There's certain things are more important and have meaning to you when you're young or different parts of your life, different ages. And they take different significance as you go along. I mean, it should be a, a value system to this, you know. Maybe use numbers, use the number system to uh, analyze it, maybe. I don't know that idea concept, I don't know. You're just saying use a number system. Change. Change. What about numbers? A number, number system. <laughs> like like ranking, ranking. Try to understand values. a little bit better what's important at certain times of our lives, you know what I mean? Uh, they kind of do have more that way. Relationships are number one, communities number two. Fulfilling a dialogue. Maybe that's too high, but uh, dialogue is very important to talk to. Different people have different concepts. Fulfilling work. Hmm? Different Sorry. people have different concepts. Well, it would be what's different. More it's important, important to have your own, your own ranking. Your right, own everybody ranking. has their own, their own set. Yeah, yeah. It's very important that each person does that, uh, you know, even though we won't agree. I think there will be a lot of agreement, though. And so, you know, there's many other sources of meaning. I just Listed some of the main ones discussed briefly. Some of the main ones. Next Anyone question. Else? <laughs> Questions over here. You know, I believe you said something about agnostics not no. take considering the question no. of an existence or non-existence of a god seriously. You say we don't know. But, but yeah, but I, I thought it was something about not considering the question seriously. And that's not been my experience. In maybe you don't do it. Uh, uh -huh. Maybe you would take the question seriously, the but a lot of agnostics dismiss it. What, what were you going to say? I take the question seriously. Good I mean, I consider that I'm All right. not a believer. It's a terrific <laughs> thing to take seriously. Yeah, but I don't think many agnostics do. They say, oh, we can't know, forget it. It's you know, it's not physical. Forget it. Third question. That's been my experience. I haven't done a scientific study or anything like that. I don't know of anything about that. But I think most agnostics don't take the question seriously. It's my very good day you do. No, but I, I've met people who kind of go the other way. They've been very serious about religion and then become very unhappy and not believing. At church, seminary, former seminary students, etc. Yeah, they've had bad experiences. That's unfortunate, and um, we don't have a good relationship to God. We're trying to seeking God in our society at all. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of disillusioned uh, theists at the ethical humanist society. Uh, <laughs> no. Who's next? Jim, you have a question? Yeah. Charlie's next. Every, every Sunday morning, I go to a place called Springbrook Community Church. I believe in, in God, the saving power of Jesus Christ, and I find a lot of meaning in it. And so do the two to three hundred people that attend services regularly. Would you say that I'm being misguided or not? Yeah. Yes. I didn't say that at all. Um, but um, I would say going to church should always be connected with seeking to know the best answer that you can know to the God question, is there really a God? You must always keep that foremost in your mind. Whether you're a believer or a non-believer, atheist, agnostic, or a theist, uh, don't go by blind faith, whatever you do. A lot of people go by blind faith, you know, they just believe. Because, you know, you know um, Pascal, a philosopher, made a wager, so either God exists or he doesn't. If God does exist, whoopee, I get heaven. If God doesn't exist, well, I'm still nothing. <laughs> you know, there won't even be the blackness again. I won't even be aware of the blackness. But if I believe in God, then I get the big prize. 
Yes, I believe in God. Uh, that's blind faith, if you ask me. That's blind faith. Uh, not even asking for reasons to believe in God. As, um, as, as a corollary, why do you have such contempt for Christianity? Did I? Well, it seems well, like it through the. Uh, from the, my education in it, yeah. You know, I had none scaring the hell out of me, scared me, you know. And they went to sincere, I guess. <laughs> Almost all of them dropped out in a few years. But, um, you know, because they were really, as they had been duped too, uh, into blind faith, most of them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, a lot of religions are, uh, I think, not really seeking God. They're assuming, assuming God. They're having faith, a blind faith in God to get the rewards, not to take the chance. <clears throat> that God doesn't exist. They, that God does exist. And, uh, how selfish can you get? And uh, you know, a lot of religions are really trying to seek meaning and just trying to save someone's soul. You know, a lot of religions are corrupt. You know. Hey, Charlie, you got a question back there? Yeah. I I question the entire validity about God giving any meaning at all to anybody. <laughs> well, you would, Charlie. You would, Charlie. He talks about personal experiences. Science only accepts public experiments as truth. You accept personal experiences as proof. You think the all the millions are wrong? Every single one of them was wrong. You accept personal experiences. As evidence of the existence of God, I personally, even millions of them, do not constitute one element of the truth. Only in your That's opinion, No, those are claims to the accepted, acknowledged body of science as the truth. Body of science what? Scientific truth. Oh, no, cut it out. <laughs> cut it out. Cut it out. Well, Science hasn't proved anything about that. What are you talking about? No, you're accepting personal experiences. That's true. Sorry, I can't hear you. You are accepting number three personal experience of God as true. It could be. I say all I said is uh, you need one uh, legitimate ca case, and God's provide. Now, how could you dismiss saying God has no meaning whatsoever? He has he tons of meaning for many people. Uh, you know, at least subjective meaning. Uh, the question should be meaningful. You dismiss it, of course, but uh, what's subjective meaning? You have blind faith in atheism. You have blind faith in materialism. You know, and it's kind of small things to put your faith in. Kind of no, those are the only things you could see. Well, you can't imagine yeah. meaning. You had your question, you turn it over. Well, you can't imagine. All right. You were next. So, uh, is uh, God on our side? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what they also like to think. That's extremely hard to know. Next question. <laughs> All right, Doug. No, that deserves Yeah, an Bob, uh, that deserves an one of your uh, sources of meaning is uh, the community and the individual's uh, relationship to the community. Would you accept that there's a, a meaning to life of a community as a whole and that, that maximizing that meaning can be part of an individual's maximizing meaning? For example, um, uh, like a group people that have a cause and uh, that that can give meaning to both the individuals and to the community that has that cause. As long as it's a good cause because you, you expect yeah. that meaning must have a positive impact. Uh, did you say cause? At the end? Yeah, a cause. For example, uh, a cause oh. of uh, saving the nation from tyranny. Oh, that kind of cause. Yeah. Well, that's what a community does. It does have a cause, it has a goal or a purpose. And uh, yeah, your, your, your question originally was, wasn't it, that uh, does the community as a whole have a meaning? And yeah, I think it does, yeah, yeah. They're working toward a common goal. 
now they're working for others and, and to make the world a little better in some way, whether it's their neighborhood uh, or their um, school or uh, their kids' school or, uh, or something you're very active in politics, which I think is too big of a cause because I don't think I, I could make any difference in that whatsoever. And I, I, I'm trying to try limit my activities to area where I could make a difference. Uh, I think it's too, com too complicated for me. All the things you said about meaning of life. Too what? Too complicated. Too, too, too com complicated. I'll read it a few times. Yeah, this thing. You. Don't you have something simple like Jesus saying, Allahu Akbar, or Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, something wet? Do not you have something like Jesus saved? Jesus saved, or Allahu Akbar. For Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, a simple way of finding meaning of life. What about Hare Krishna, what is the meaning of life? I mean, I mean I, what, what is Jesus, Jesus saved? Yeah. Can somebody, somebody speak for me? I think he wants a slogan, <coughs> and I think he wants to, to figure out yeah, like if a slogan and some of the, the oh, sayings of other saved. religions oh, Jesus saves. Are, are instruments in helping you achieve meaning. Well, yeah, sure, so some of the religions can help you, and a lot of, you, a lot of them lead you down the path of faith, blind faith, um, save yourself forever, supposedly. But uh, they, they could, you know. And Eastern religions have been very effective in the third argument for God, the personal experiences. They've given us a lot about that, and a lot of practice on that. And I, you know, like Charlie, I believe that's legitimate. And there's, there's, you certainly can find cases of that. But uh, is the question too complicated? Well, sure, it's a big question. What, what, what do you expect from our lives? Do you want things simple, easy, concrete, physical? all the time, everything. No, I did try to make it as simple and clear as I could. And, and you know, it is, it is a big, a very big question. And it's not easy, definitely not easy. No, no it's kind of good. It's definitely. Um, Thomas Paine was the guy that wrote a book. Who? Age of Reason, Thomas Paine. Oh yeah, Thomas Paine, Age of Reason. How did that book influence so much the French that they uh, start pushing away the religion and trying to live by reason? Uh, There's a second part to that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm oh, good because uh, I can't answer the first part because I haven't read Thomas Paine's Age of Reason. I haven't read it, so I, I don't know how I did, but. Uh, people are trying to see, you know, uh, trying to understand, you know, they could understand the world finally through science, and then they, so they kind of uh, uh, gave up on religion a lot. And, well, and there was an educated class that they could appeal to, to, to be rational and to see, or to see that there uh, was doubts that could be raised about traditional religious belief, and he was part of that. Did you say there was a second yeah. part of your question? You know, oh, about this thing of uh, participating wow. or being wow. strongly with your community, right? Yeah. Uh, watch out, because if you were born in some uh, communities, you might be performing sacrifices. Oh, no, don't be a member of every community. Find a meaningful community. Meaningful. Oh, yeah. what's me? Oh, and you get me. Uh, I defined it at the start. That, a, a, a community that performs sacrifices is just as meaningful to them as the one that doesn't believe in it. Yeah, it is. But I tried to distinguish at the end between subjective and objective meaning, and I and I I can't finish. Uh, Subject of meaning, I said, don't go by that. That's not important. Yeah, go by object of meaning. Find meaning in the real world that, that makes life better, that has a better impact. 
you could do it when your actions is easier, ideas is harder, pretty hard. You won't have any choice, Bob. You won't have any choice. Once you're born in there and you acquire the, those beliefs by birth, practically. How do you change? <laughs> by your free choice, by educating yourself, by thinking, that's the only way. And it's very difficult because our society, even this one, rich as it is, um, we don't encourage that whatsoever. You know, or maybe a little, maybe a little, but. Breaking away is so hard to do. <laughs> oh yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard to uh, free yourself. It's very hard to be free. And very hard not to be brainwashed and conditioned and caused by your society to do practically everything you do. It's very hard to be free. I hope this book will not grip us uh, like Thomas Paine's book did. Wow. That's a very, th the, the way he uh, frames was maneuvered we say we are, we are now living by reason instead of dogmas. And yeah. Like now. We missed that. Uh, yeah. Thomas Paine wrote that. He said. Yeah. Uh, it sounds better to go by reason than dogma. Okay. Okay. But the person, I risk my um, case. Don't want to make do it you, uh, uh, you, We handed out this uh, article from 1991. Yeah. And you showing up. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it because in it there's a list. Yeah. Of tips, ten tips, and I like that a lot. Um, but nowhere in the for making meaning, ten tips for making meaning. Yeah. So uh, nowhere in, in here is any mention of God, and in your presentation you, there is a fairly large section yeah, on probably. religion. What's yeah, well, what changed between then and now? Nothing. Uh, not much. I, I always was a seeker of God. Um, it just didn't come out in that article, and the, the, the writer, John Anderson, didn't ask about it. It didn't come up much. And I don't think it is a big part of the meaning of life. But it does, the question has enormous meaning. You know, I disagree totally with Charlie about that. You know. uh, Tim. Last night, I was at a White Sox game. And in the bottom of the seventh, two home runs were hit, which brought the Sox into the lead. And I felt a real rise of uh, a chill inside of me, saying, wow, they did it. They took a mediocre game and went on to win. A few years ago, our Cubs won the World Series. And for a lot of people, that brings meaning. Well, Can you sad. comment yeah. or not? That's really sad if they got to get their meaning from that. You're wrong, my friend. They're all the You're wrong. wrong. The That's very sad. It shows how shallow and superficial our society is if they think that the most superficial lives. Yeah. And no I, I was on a train and all the people were talking about the Cubs, you know. And, You're uh, biased. Yeah, I had to escape from there. Makes them happy. Makes them happy. It's out shows me. It's, it's, it's a childish. It's for boys and girls. It should be for adults. Yeah. Why do they have to do with our lives? It has a lot to do with our lives, my <laughs> friends. To do with our lives. <laughs> Baseball and some of the sports have a big, significant meaning in our lives. Well, you're talking factually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm yeah. Not, <laughs> yeah. There's no way I'm not talking said before. I'm talking, I'm talking philosophically. I'm talking philosophically about what it ought to be. And we always should not glorify baseball players. They got physical skills, big deal. What does that mean? You don't need them today. You know? Why do we glorify them? They're all mercenaries anyhow, Dean. I said before, when you're 14 years old, baseball means a lot to you. Now, you can be 56, okay. doesn't mean a darn thing to you. You care less you play a game again. It, it is important for some people. You're, you're well, bad. it is. Your uh, priorities at different times in your life mean different things. It's, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's a mixed bag of thoughts a lot of this. It's not one, yeah, well, not one set of thoughts. It's a mixed bag of thoughts. You should draw more from these objective sources than men. By the way, this example of the creative idea. <laughs> that was my last example, a light bulb going on. 
Charlie Yeah, yeah. 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 Lichtenberg. Uh, you talk here in number three or number two, and you said you talk some about. But first, you give a scientific fact about the universe, and then you know you go on and you say there's some grand design to the universe. And I presume you accept the designs of those world religions that you show up on the screen. But if not, go back to it there. Why did you, you just pass it? Why do all of those have different grand designs? In Christianity has so many multiple grand designs, what can, you couldn't even accumulate a list of them all. There's no agreement whatsoever on the grand design. There's tons of agreement on that there is a green design. You know, you know, you know, tons read, of agreement? Read Darwin. Darwin, Among Darwin the world describes religions? it in much detail. Excuse me, I'm trying to say something. <laughs> Darwin described it in much detail, all the grand design. And he gave a reason for it. I and mean, to him, that wasn't enough either. But, but you know, that, that's him. There's, all right. there's a lot of evidence of design. Wait a minute. Follow up. None of those. Now, if you don't see the design, you're not looking. None of those world religions, except Darwin, are well, most of them don't. Are you telling me that right, they accept Darwin's design? No, I'm not telling you that at all. I'm just saying it's fairly obvious to everyone but you <laughs> that no. there's a green design and me. on Earth. You don't think there's a green design either? Those religions don't exist. Everything works so well, plants and animals survive. Isn't that amazing how But you those know, religions to that? which give meaning to lives, their design doesn't accept our one. Okay. All right. It's eight o'clock. You're not going to agree. You're not going to listen to anything. Hey, who who hasn't had a question yet? Okay. Well, some so, people uh, had two, and I raised my hand up before I walked. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Last question. We got to go to rebuttals. Why the, the, I did not want to ask you about the, the title of your book, but you just uh, somebody asked, "Is God on our side?" That's been very important. In history, both sides in the West think God is on their side. They pray to God for victory. The Germans thought God was on their side. The English, the French, the Americans thought he was on their side. But I wanted to ask you, why did you name your book Making Meaning instead of uh, Finding Reason? Finding Meaning? Finding, finding me Meaning. Uh, the Meaning of the Universe. You seem to be saying everybody make up almost an artifice. Find out some something that makes you happy, gets you through life. But it's not no. it, it, it may not be objective, connected to any real I'm very opposed to that. Then you'd be a Cubs fan. So what's wrong with being a Cubs fan? It's shallow, superficial. Yeah. And it's oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Come on, Where on you. We got oh. the, the title oh. of my oh. last question over here. Oh. Oh. It's a little fun oh. for boys and girls. Speak oh. up. Oh. 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 All right. Speak up. Bouncing a ball around, is that the meaning of life? Bouncing a ball around, is that the meaning of life? All right, thank you, everybody. Give our speaker a hand. All right. Take a seat and make notes of your rebuttals if you want. All right. Who has rebuttals? Let's get up there. How many? Let's have a show of hands. Who wants to say a few words and give a rebuttal? Keep the hands up so I can get a count. One, two, Charlie, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, okay. eleven. We're going to have to go with about three minutes each. Three minutes apiece. Or some people can just yield their time to yeah. always go up there. <laughs> All right, now let's get up there. Jonathan, you're first. No, Jonathan's not first. Who wants to be first? <laughs> I'll make the first comment. The, Cub, the Cubs winning the World Series, World Series was World Series. The Cubs winning the World Series was a a light bulb moment where everybody could see that God's hand was involved. It was an act of God. Thank you. Subway Series. You know, in a lot of ways, I think he's right. Because look at that 17-minute rain delay they had at the uh, on, in extra innings. 
they were about ready to lose. And uh, when you have a 17-minute delay like that, and they come back out and regroup, oh, it definitely was a inspired no, moment from God. It. No. <laughs> That's it. You tell him, Tim. <laughs> All right, next. Doug. Okay. Uh, Doug Binkley, I want to thank Bob for uh, uh, for his thanks uh, for the uh, help I gave him with the uh, book, putting it together. Um, some of this, these technical difficulties that <laughs> that, um, um, that the uh, uh, technological advances have thrown at some of us uh, that are hard to deal with. And, uh, uh, a few of them threw me for a loop, and I had to get a friend of mine, Keith Cooper, to help out with those. Uh, and Keith was uh, the one who uh, designed the uh, covers of the two books, so uh, he just stepped out, but I uh, wanted to recognize him. So, um, a, a brilliant, uh, brilliant designer and a, uh, and a uh, computer genius, too. Uh, now, I want to say, um, uh, enlarging, uh, there's so many things in this book. Bob has um, really done a great job. He has a, uh, he has a great design. He has a vision, and uh, there aren't enough books about really um, acquiring meaning in your life um, as a, an actual uh, objective. And he's right that people don't do enough of that. Uh, it requires a kind of introspection. It requires a kind of discipline that most people don't have, and that they should. And uh, people should involve themselves in thinking about the deep questions, the great questions. I remember when I was young and I and my mom bought me a set of the great books, uh, the, uh, uh, that set that was uh, put out by Mortimer Adler and um, it had in it Thomas Aquinas and Bob mentioned and other great thinkers, uh, you know, the great works of Shakespeare and, uh, uh, and scientific works. Like uh, with Newton and, and even Freud, um, and it had a set of like, the great ideas, or something called the Syntopic. And I think meaning was in those great ideas. Uh, I'd have to double check about that, but something similar to meaning was in there. And, uh, people don't think about things in that way anymore. I remember that we did. Um, there were uh, groups that got together to talk about the great ideas. We don't have that so much anymore. Uh, luckily, the College of Complexes exists, and thank goodness for that. It's a great institution in this city that we do have these uh, get-togethers where we do talk about these things, and uh, they are very important. It is important for a person to uh, give meaning to their life and uplift others by helping to give meaning to, to them, too. Um, and uh, we, we should be leaders in that because we're intellectuals. And we are, we are um, people that can help that happen. Um, uh, whether you spend a whole lot of time worrying about the whether God exists or not, um, as long as you study the arguments and, and spend some time thinking about them, and as long as you use that to inspire you to be a better person in the sense of, of both what you know Jesus uh, proposed and what some of the other religions that we can consider to be moral religions have proposed, that will make you a better person too. And uh, I like it that Bob wants to stress that the meaning of your life should be positive. And I also want to stress that uh, that can be um, giving a positive uh, effect to, uh, uh, to a better, greater cause than yourself as in the community I'm with, which is refused fascism, um, in uh, trying to prevent tyranny from taking over our country and trying to restore democracy. And whether you call that political or whether I call it a moral obligation, um, that is an important thing and that gives meaning to my life. Thank you. I know you are rooting for me, and at the very same time, you know that I am rooting for you. It's how to break the mold, it's how to turn the tide, it's how to free the soul, it's how to spark the meaning in all of us. Uh, let's do the opposite of what the corporate rat race culture expects of us. 
Let's make this group effort a revolutionary example of how to identify and develop all the necessary skills to be our best. All the necessary skills to be a, what I like to call a we the people evolution of peace, of love, of equality, democracy, transparency, justice, and protection of Mother Earth. Indeed, healing of Mother Earth and celebration of our coexistence. Uh, number one, uh, to know each other and each other's dreams. Support each other each day by communicating encouragement and interest in the goals we all are working towards. Number two, be confident. The giant each of us is becomes evident when we voice our confident energy to ourselves and each other as much as humanly possible. Number three, use the tools that are available. Go to the library if you can every day. Go to the newsstand if you can every day. Go to the bookstore if you can every day. Go to the town hall meeting if you can every day. Go to the local grassroots community center if you can every day. Go to the nonprofit organization if you can every day. Go to the local place that is a great study spot if you can every day. Creativity spot, maker's space, reflection spot, especially nature if you can every day. Number four, discover your dreams by organizing for them. Uh, just look at the model of all the popular people's struggles in the past, whether it's the abolitionist movement, the suffragist movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, or more recently, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement. Number five, achieve happiness. As a people on a planet, it's we who make it happen. We who make it happen, we. A people of a planet, it's free and we have it. Free, we all have it, peace. As a people from a planet, each of us imagine, each of us imagine, each. As a people with a planet, we can reach a balance. We can reach a balance. Reach. Thank you, Bob, for a very interesting and enlightening talk this evening. Thank you. My name is Raj Patel. It's interesting but very complicated for me. You know. It, 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 such a such a lecture had to be simple. I I have some problem for God because I have appointed myself to be a God. So so I have no problem about you know. If anybody want to fight out their God, that's their problem, not mine. I can go to any church. I can go to synagogue or I can go to Catholic church or Protestant church or Hindu or mosque, and it is my home. Because. I exist everywhere. The, the, if you, for average person, if he doesn't bother about why he is here and meaning of life or seeking God, he'll be happier. Just go, have a job, work, live a simple life, love your family, love your neighbors, and hey, there is meaning of life. Because, uh, after all is said and done, what they say in the church or all the religious places, it means nothing. If a, if a God is going to God or the, this philosophical thing is going to change the life and make the world better, it could have already. Jesus was born 2,000 years ago. Krishna was born 5,000 years ago. It hasn't happened. What has changed life most for an average person and I should say, science and technology. Science and technology came three hundred, four hundred years ago. It had a more done to more people from a poverty to better life than any religion, any any philosophy, anything. Okay, they just kept on working. You know, Microsoft had done more than probably the whole world than anybody else. Steve Jobs had done tremendous contribution. Facebook, more than two billion people are involved in there. I mean, all this, all this is, we are talking about connecting. We are talking about feeling one. And still, 
we are facing a great challenges, which I wrote in my opinion letter. That, that we, cannot, we, we cannot be looking for many, we can be looking for bettering our life. Mm -hmm. That's all we can do. Work hard, you know, get as much knowledge as you can, you require in your job or in your surrounding, in your, your community. And if you want to feel fairly involved and you feel good, that's fine. But do not get involved believing that you are some kind of a great guy and you're going to make all world better. It doesn't work that way. Only, I think, I think probably, if I have to, I have to point out anybody who has done very well by religion, a Jew, they have done very, very well. Why would we want, I don't we want you, because they, know they believe in education and they believe in hard work and they believe in relationships and connections. Okay, thank you. that someone has appointed himself to be a god. God, I wouldn't have had that. I wouldn't have had that kind of a honorary, but uh, never mind. Um, with regard to those to those folks who say that um, there's something inconsistent between religion and science, I strongly disagree, and it's like trying to compare apples and oranges. Even the Roman Catholic Church has said that they that has said that they endorse the ideas of Darwin and that they endorse the ideas of science. And my own branch of Judaism, Reform Judaism, very definitely goes along the same lines. They too endorse Darwin and the teachings of science and don't feel that they don't feel that there's anything inconsistent between science and God. And as for the idea that personal experience should be rejected, I'm sorry, I don't buy that. Each of us has our own personal experience, and it makes no difference whether we believe in religion or which one, whether we're agnostic or even atheists. Everyone has their own personal experience and has to decide these matters for themselves. Finally, somebody else asked whether God is on our side. President Eisenhower in 1955 went to a prayer breakfast where they, where they were asking when how best to be on God's side. That's kind of how I look at it. Everything <laughs> is I'll get up there and let him know, Charlie. Oh, I have no well, doubt he will. <laughs> scientific truth is the same as personal experience. That's not so what I said, Charlie. Thanks. I, uh, I believe the hand of God was in play last night because oh, yeah. Tim and I were at the same White Sox game in Charlie's neighborhood. We didn't, we didn't know about it during all this night. Divine providence, my friend. Yeah. So that was weird. Anyway, um, you know, this group here is uh, all about meaning. The College of Complexes were very virtuous. We're anti <laughs> I don't know if I quite go along with that. <laughs> or we're anti war. And, um, you know, I always thought that uh, we were supposed to leave this world a better place than when we found it. So that gives me some meaning. And doing, you know, to, a, to your neighbor or friend as you'd have done to yourself. Uh, so it kind of gives me some meaning. And... In the words of Elvis, <laughs> okay. since it was Elvis night, Elvis night, yeah. A little less talk, a little more action. Well, <laughs> right on. Here, here. Happy Elvis night. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 the information. Yeah. appreciate the talk, respect the information Yeah. 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 Yeah.
briefly, I want to, there were some comments about the air and water show. Um, uh, I like the air and water show. Uh, I'm, I am not, I am not uh, a big fan of war. And I don't see the air and water show as pr promoting war. I just like airplanes. It's fun, they're fast, they're loud. Getting older, so the loudest is good for me anymore. I, I think that uh, I, I respect people who uh, who are fighting this this crazy uh, American political and industrial momentum to make everything about war and all resolute uh, um, all resolving conflicts with war. Eight hundred military bases around the world, insane military budget when we have people literally just starving in the streets. It's crazy, but but blaming, I've seen people blame troops in the misguided attempt to fight war. I've seen people, we're now blaming tools in the misguided attempt to fight war. It's, uh, it's um, you're, you know, I think you got to just pick your battles and focus more on the politics. It's really the politics and the public momentum that supports this kind of stuff, and uh, and just a bunch of airplanes. I think you're just kind of wasting time. So regarding uh, religion, um, uh, anybody who goes to buy a used car, they talk to a salesman, and he's going to say it runs great. And you're not going to trust him. You're going to be like, prove it, and take it for a test drive. Uh, if uh, if a company's selling drugs and they say that they're safe, you're going to say prove it, and you're going to want to look at testing or a government that supports testing to prove that they're safe. Um, if uh, somebody's committed of a, of a crime, you don't just throw them in jail. You're like, hey, you got to prove he committed the crime. Um, when Bush claimed that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, there were a handful of us like me marching in the streets going, prove it. Let's try to start a war. We, on your word, prove it. Now we got Trump, who is the master of throwing around mud without proving anything. <laughs> Any rational person is going to say, is going to say, we want to see some evidence. And one of the biggest and most historic questions in the history of man is the existence of God. And all of a sudden, rationality is thrown out the window. You don't have to prove it. Oh no. Well, I feel there's a God. I talk to him, and I think he's talking about. That, to me, is just not rational. Um, the, the, the comment that uh, the question is too big for atheists, I just think is really condescending. Um, Charlie was making, a, I think, a very valid point. It's like, where's some scientific truth with, about that? I just think it's an incredibly honest and super simple question, and he didn't even answer it. He just blew him off. Um, Talking about uh, the grand design of uh, the world is ignoring reality. Out of uh, if you believe in um, uh, in ant what anthropologists study, then uh, you'll realize that 99% of the animals that have been created in the world are now extinct. That's a weird design. And now we have humans who threaten our own survival. But who's, who's fighting it? You've got Christians who are saying, well, we're not going to. We don't have to worry about nuclear war. We don't have to worry about global warming, because God would never let that happen. He, right. he won't let it happen, so we don't have to work towards fighting against this stuff. It is, it is very frustrating for a rational person to listen to that stuff. I would like to end this rant with a quote from a very thoughtful and intelligent person, Bob Lichtenberg. <laughs> In the handout he gave, he gave uh, 10 tips for a meaningful life. Number eight says, don't try to escape a sense of meaningless, meaninglessness. Now, he uses examples like alcohol, drugs, or TV. What I would add is superstition. <laughs> All right. That guy behind you there. Yeah, all night. Uh, the speaker gave a very interesting talk. He covered a lot of ideas. He covered a lot of ground. But it reminds me of a story. There was a fox 
and a cat, and they were talking, and there were some hunters coming by. And the fox said, I know all kinds of tricks to escape the, the hunters. The cat said, I only know one trick. So the fox started running, and the cat went up the tree. And after about several hours, the hunters came back with a fox across the saddle. The fox knew all of the tricks, but the cat knew the one trick that worked. Personal experience is all I've got. I'm searching for God everywhere. And if you look for him and you're generally yet open, you will find him. And when you find him, you will experience God's glory. Here, here. Here, here. Absolutely. It's not my job to convince you. I'm only one small tool in God's tool bag. It's the Holy Spirit who will lead you to God. I'm praying everybody in this room have a Damascus Road experience and meet God. And I tell everybody everywhere, just remember three letters. P-L-O. Pray, listen, and obey, and everything will go smoothly in your life. Yellow. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, you got me over one more? All right. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm going to hurry. You're holding this down. Right. All right, let's go. We got an empty microphone and no rebutters. This is crazy. We're waiting for Mo. You got it? I stood up. I could get an award for that. The American of the Real Collegiate is the rebutter speech you haven't heard. All right, Mo, let's, uh, we're interested in hearing. Okay, time to even say that. You got a couple minutes, or we're short a on A couple? Yeah, we're Come on, Mo, hurry up. Four. I said two minutes is not going to kill anybody. All right, you're going. Here, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Use the mic, Mo. Oh, yeah, the mic. Thank you. What would I do without you, Tim? <clears throat> I was an atheist at the age of five. I was an atheist at the age of 25. I was an atheist at the age of 55. I was an atheist at the age of 85. I won't tell you what happened to me recently. I should probably make a speech on that. But I want to say something logical. Dostoevsky, who was almost as great a Christian as Tolstoy, yeah, right. probably in, uh, I think in, in the Brothers Karamazov, has a dialogue between two characters. And one of them is saying something that indicates either he has a, 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 he is saying bad things about someone or he's planning to do something bad. I forget which it was. And the other character had a very simple response. He said, oh, you don't believe in God. There's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of implications in that. Uh, one of the implications is drawn out by Jesus whom I don't particularly think is any more the son of God than any of you, or a daughter of God. Uh, when Jesus said, that's my daughter probably calling, I'll call her later, back, call her back later. Right, no answer, please. No, no. Um, Jesus said, when two are gathered in my name, I shall be there. Now, I am not, as I say, I'm not a believer in the, any special holiness of Jesus any more than the holiness of any one of your inner soul. Your job is to bring out your holiness, which means kindness to others. And therein lies God. Now you may think that's saying that the God is, I don't know, sand or something. There's much more to it than that. And I'll end by saying I look forward to making a speech on the Dostoevsky's concept of God, which is not the, the old man in the long white beard sitting on the golden throne. It's not an intelligence. It's not um, the creator of the world. Uh, William James had a conception of God that was different. When we argue about God, 
we have to define our terms. There's the concept of the creator of the world. I'm not talking about the creator of the world. There's the concept of the listener to, to prayers. Well, I think there's a way in which prayers can be answered. I'll go into all of this when I'm arranging my talk. Thank you for your kind attention, and thank you for forgiving me for my presumption in making a speech here, not having heard the main speech. Thank you. <laughs> should be allowed. Should be allowed. <laughs> I've got a couple of quick observations. All right, all right, guys. All right, all right. One fool at a time, please. Yeah. Uh, Bertrand Russell wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian back around 1910. And uh, he was jailed for being a pacifist, I think, during World War One. And when they asked him to uh, mark the box called religion, he put down agnostic. And the, the jailer said, well, they all believe in the same God. So <laughs> Russell, uh, is, I read that book because I came out of the Vietnam War. And he said, if you did get the leaders of a hundred major religions together in one room, they all think, each one of them thinks they have their own true way to God. He would say, mathematically, I can tell you, one of you may be right, but the other 99 are wrong, and I don't know which one that is. So it's a question of faith. Also, my father called, uh, called it something called the universal mind. Um, there are examples of things that happen to people that are just unbelievably unexplainable. You know, if you look at uh, the books of uh, people who have near-death experiences, uh, especially, uh, I've read dozen, probably two dozen anecdotes or stories of people that were on a ladder up painting the side of their house or something, and they're up, you know, 20, 30 feet off the ground, and a wind comes up or something, and the ladder starts to fall back this way, and when they know they're going to fall and hit the ground, it feels like a big hand comes out of the air and just pushes them back up against the wall. That's one of the things, uh, there's a lot of reports like that. They can't all be ignored. I had a car accident um, in uh, 2000, uh, oh, uh, 1972. At any rate, uh, I ran off the road. I drifted off the road. That was before we were required to wear seatbelts. Didn't have my seatbelt on. I drifted off the road going north on the Northwest Tollway and hit a parked car, a heavier, much heavier car than mine that was stopped. And my car was absolutely totaled. It spun around and across the lane, and I came up facing the other way. I jumped out, and I was looking to see if anybody was injured in the other car. The police got there in a minute or two, and the police said, where's, where's the driver? And they're looking at this car, and the windshield's all caved in where the driver went through it. The steering wheel is caved in where the, my chest hit it. There were uh, big dents in the, the dashboard, and I had, I had a scratch on my lip. That was it. And the police were saying, well, where's, where's the driver? This is obviously a fatal accident. Nobody could survive that, much less without any significant injuries or bruises at all. So uh, you talk about meaning in life. These things happen. Almost everybody you talk to will have any, uh They don't talk about these experiences. People say, oh, well, that's, uh, you're hallucinating. That, that can't have happened. That can't be true. But uh, there are things that I would, uh, Admonish you or encourage you to look up a man named Edgar Casey. He was called the Sleeping Prophet. He gave life readings, communicating with the subconscious mind through whatever spirits there were all over the world. It was a phenomenon that the doctors documented, scientists. They had no answer for what he could do. But uh, many, many different people uh, claimed uh, to have some kind of spiritual uh, experience that is not related to God himself. So nobody really knows, but uh, there's a lot of near-death experiences where people are dead, they rise up out of their body on the operating table, and some of them claim to have gone to heaven, and they've come back, and they've been clinically dead for eight or ten minutes during the operation, and they come back to life. So all I can say is, uh, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that something is out there, whether we call it God or universal mind that my father called it. Uh, there's all kinds of uplifting experiences where people are helped and, and not harmed by it. So 
come next weekend, we will talk about uh, some really interesting things that uh, you may not have heard of. Uh, that's it for me. You going to wrap up, Charlie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's once again thank our speaker for a nice presentation on, on, on philosophical topics here. Uh, apparently, writing books of this nature brought you great personal meaning, uh, as well as the assistance and friendship of another person, which uh, by itself uh, this is an accomplishment. I'll be eclectic as usual here. First of all, on your handout, you reference a Big Bang, and then you try to discuss what took place before the Big Bang. There's a limit to the knowledge. Our knowledge terminates at the Big Bang. Absolutely no one is authorized to say anything regarding any aspect of what took place before that. There's a, there's a line drawn right there. And you cannot, you're not authorized to say anything about, and you're saying, well, there has to be some sort of entity or something. No, that is, we've done remarkable, it's the scientific community has done remarkably well ascertained that the Big Bang, to me, is remarkable, 13.7. That is, the, at the moment, that's the barrier, and we can't trust over that. Yeah, Regarding yeah. science and personal experience, it's very simple. Science requires tests and measurements yeah. if you wish calibration. If I see anything that ascertains or claims to be truth and it has no measurements, no calibration, no mathematics, I am reluctant to accept it at all. Sure. To me, that is invalid. Uh, that some sort of personal testimony. It, it requires replication of a community of individuals who can replicate the conditions, observe what took place, and then ascertain what, what is going on there. In absence of that, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's not accepted. It, it's a little more accepted to say, well, there's scientific experiments, and then I could say, well, I had a close encounter with the first kind last night. Okay, you all believe me, right? I don't have any evidence of truth, but no, you don't have any criteria of truth, so it's got to be accepted, right? That's what I heard here tonight. That's a lot of hooey. Now, now the first of the, here's the thing, the thing about one, two, five, is your, your meaning of life take place in the real world the very concrete world. You have to have real relationships, meaning two individuals, a community of people, a dialogue. You have work, an authentic occupation, possessions. But then you come to six, where you get into theology, and then you can create the universe as you see fit. And that is not the way it's done. You, if you have meaning, it's got to be achieved within the real world, not the world of this, the, the, the other one, the imaginary one. Now instead of having here, let me explain. Instead of having authentic relationships, you say, God loves me. <laughs> See, it's, it's a lot easier, right? Instead of having genuine friendships and cultivating those friendships, he loves you or too, meeting Charlie. another real woman, and establishing a love relationship, you just say, well, God loves me, and I love God. See, it's a lot easier. But no, no, it, 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 it doesn't work that. All right, moving on. Uh, I'm sorry, there is no grand design. And we certainly don't know what it is. But it's not been established that there is a grand design, we don't know what it Where is. Where were you, Charlie, when the foundations of the world were? No, wow. I mean, the... The, the last thing I will say, though, is that uh, you did overlook this here, number three, and I think this is very true. Number three, he says, the main meaning of life comes through a dialogue. It involves a serious discussion of useful ideas between people instead of a lot of trivia. Total trivia. 
I want to thank you for that. That's kind of the defining aspect of the college of complexes. Now you can go to baseball games, which is total <laughs> trivia, and pay six dollars it cost you. Fifty bucks. <laughs> Twenty. <laughs> for nothing. For total trivia. And it was a <laughs> hell of a lot of fun and watching you, the Sox win you, last night. You thought it was a <laughs> I had a grand uh, ball. For total trivia. Part of a good I, design. No, yes. get out of here. Yeah. Anyhow, You're out. Get out of here. You're congratulations out. Congratulations on your book. Yeah. And looking forward to your next You're book. out. Very Thanks, much. John. Why was there a big bang? <laughs> God damn more again. That's what uh, Total trivia. Uh, what what happened happened baseball game. game. You're out. It's all this man. <laughs> All right, Bob, wrap it up. Thank you for your comments. Uh, and I'll be brief because it's pink and hot here. You know why? Someone complained about the AC, so to save you know, a well, future customer, they had to turn off the AC. And they know it's going to get stinking hot real fast, but they did it anyway. Just save one customer. Is that capitalism or what? Um, there's Boober we talked about, uh, significant dialogue. Uh, that Charlie was just talking about, and he's fostered for many years here at the college, <laughs> and I much applaud his efforts. Um, yeah, he did need a lot of introspection to engage in a search for meaning. Most people lack it. Uh, and I don't know what to do about that. Um, just trying to develop it yourself and try to avoid the corporate rat race that Jonathan advised. <laughs> it's all materialistic. That's all I care about. That's all they can conceive. They're like Charlie. Uh, you know, there, there's a great misconception about the role of science. You know, science does do some good things, sure. Rosh it does a lot of good things and made life better. But you know, science has no answers to the why questions. No answers whatsoever. They can tell how a lot of things are done. They can't tell you why the hell we're here. You know, or why why of anything. It's great on the how, but it's very narrow. It is very narrow. It has done a lot of good. But there's a lot of meaning we can get from our uh, own views. And a lot of people dismiss those as uh, opinions and what you want. And a lot of people do engage in that. There's no doubt about that. But I think there's a great lack of knowledge about logic. And that logic can really help our thinking much better. It can, it can really improve our thinking and can show it's more than. Um, more than just an opinions, we could substantiate our opinions, we could have logical opinions that could really be shown, it can't be physically proven, which is what some people demand. But if people... Could we wait with that for five minutes there? Some, some people demand that they're rejecting a lot of reality. They're rejecting the possibility of reality, some bigger realities. Um, well, um... Yeah, to express interest in other people and what they're doing, that'll make meaning. That'll make, give you meaning and give meaning to other people's lives, too. Um, and yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And I won't stop crying out loud. Um, um, yeah, thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate it. Uh, you're a handful of you enlightened, but you know what? I'm really disappointed at the turnout chart. It's available to most people. Most people avoid it. And they're just engaging in escapes, and they're everywhere. I mean, people just can escape, and it's it's really uh, disappointing. I don't know what to do about it. Making meaning, even making meaning is a very tough sell because the escapes from it are very strong, and, and I, I really don't know what to do about it. Thank you. Thanks a million for coming out. Go back to the universe. All right. Sure. Oh, you want the universes? Yeah. Just remember, in every one of those, every one of those yeah. things is a galaxy. Uh, and you just pass it. Uh, and there are billions of stars in them. One last thing for those that want to hear about people that have tremendous meaning in their life and are doing constructive things to make a difference, come next week. Uh, have printed literature right. with names and examples of good stuff. People that have great meaning in their lives all over the world. Thank you, and we are adjourned. We'll see you next week.